Are you a conformist? Of course you're not, but most other people are, right? Damn sheeple, they always act and dress the same way and believe the same things as everyone around them, never truly thinking for themselves. But why is this? Why is it so hard to go against the crowd? Which of these lines is longer? It's B, right? Okay, of course it's A. But is there any situation where you would feel like you had to say B just to fit in with a bunch of strangers? Well, in Ash's research, he managed to get three quarters of his participants to at least once give in to conformity and give an obviously wrong response. So we'll review that research and a few ways Ash modified his study to increase and decrease the social pressure to conform. The PsychBoost app now has three features, flashcards, multiple choice quizzes, and see if you can work out the key term from its definition with the key term tester. Try Paper 1 for free right now. And Patreon supporters can watch PsychBoost videos ad-free, learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos, and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. Types of conformity. A commonly accepted definition of conformity is given by Aronson. Conformity is a change in behavior or belief as a result of real or imagined group pressure. So an individual changing what they do or how they think because of what they consider to be pressure coming from a larger group. I think the point about the imagined pressure is interesting. I think we can all think of a time when we felt the need to change how we behaved to fit in with a group, and likely that group actually didn't care or even notice. Keep in mind when it comes to conformity, we're not talking about the individual altering their behaviour due to taking a direct order. The members of these groups are likely to be groups of peers, they're not authority figures. Obedience is obeying the direct orders of an authority figure. Obedience is a separate form of social influence that we'll discuss later on in this unit. But I do find students new to the social influence unit often get the two confused. Kelman claims there are three types of conformity. These are compliance, identification, and internalization. In order, these range from a shallow level of conformity to the deepest level of conformity. Let's clearly define each of them. Compliance is a type of conformity where, in response to pressure from others, individuals change their behavior or what they outwardly claim to be their beliefs, but their private beliefs won't change. The primary motivation behind compliance is the desire to get a positive reaction from others, either avoiding disapproval or punishment. Compliance is often driven by normative social influence, which is an explanation for conformity that suggests we conform to be liked or accepted by others. I'll say more about this explanation in the next section. The changes in behavior due to compliance are superficial. This means that they're only on the surface and are temporary, only lasting as long as the external pressure is present. Once the social pressure is removed, so they're not in the presence of the group, individuals will go back to their original beliefs or behaviours. An everyday example of compliance is when someone participates in a social media trend, not because they find them meaningful or enjoyable, but because they want to fit in with their peers or online communities. They may use hashtags without fully understanding the cause or idea behind them, or take part in viral challenges they know are dangerous. The identification type of conformity is seen as an intermediate level of conformity. The individual takes on the behaviours, attitudes or values of a group because they want to be associated with the group. Unlike compliance, which is conformity to avoid rejection, identification is about the individual aligning with a group to create or strengthen a social identity. So with identification, the individual conforms not necessarily because they believe the behaviours or values are correct, but they do want to feel connected with the group, to be seen as a member and maintain a relationship with the group. This is clear when we look at behaviours in workplaces, social clubs, religious organisations, and even smaller units like friendship groups. These groups have a certain culture, and people will adapt what they do and say to match, ultimately to feel like they belong. For example, a person might start listening to a particular genre of music or dress in a certain way because they identify with a social group that values those things, even if they don't actually prefer that type of music or style. The key aspect of identification is the individual's behaviour is influenced more by the relationship with the group and the value of that relationship rather than some deep agreement with the group's norms or even a fear of rejection. Internalisation is a type of conformity where individuals truly adopt the beliefs, values or norms of a group. So this deepest level of conformity results in a private and lasting change in beliefs and behaviours because the individual truly accepts the group's norms as their own. Internalization happens when the individual perceives the group's norms or values as matching their own values, 
or when they believe that accepting these norms is morally right or beneficial. So the motivation behind internalization is driven by the individual's desire for correctness. They conform because they see the group's norms as correct or superior to their previous beliefs or behaviours. For this reason, the matching explanation for conformity is informational social influence. A key feature of internalization is the changes or beliefs and behaviors remain, even when there's no longer any external pressures to conform, so when the individual is away from the group. This is because the individual has permanently integrated the group's beliefs or norms into their own value system. An example of internalization might be a person who starts recycling and campaigning for environmental causes after being exposed to convincing arguments and evidence about climate change from a group they respect. At first, they may not have had strong feelings about environmental issues. But over time, as they learn more, they generally come to believe in the importance of these actions for ethical reasons. And this belief influences their behavior even when they're not around the group. Explanations for conformity. As I've just mentioned, there are two explanations for conformity. If asked to explain the reasons why people conform, you should write about informational social influence and normative social influence. Let's start with normative social influence. This explanation suggests that the need for social acceptance is a powerful motivator for human behavior, and individuals will conform because they fear being socially rejected or becoming an outcast. Conformity driven by normative social influence results in compliance, individuals publicly agreeing with the group norms or behaviors but not changing their private beliefs. This is superficial, lasting only as long as the group's influence is present. We can say NSI is emotionally driven. People want to feel connected, supported and valued by their peers, making them more likely to conform to avoid negative feelings associated with rejection. The typical example of NSI is peer pressure. Teenagers often behave in ways they know might be risky or against their values, such as smoking, drinking and drug use, and often this is driven by the fear of being excluded or mocked by their friends. Informational social influence happens when individuals assume the group has more knowledge or information about a situation. This form of influence is particularly powerful in situations where there's ambiguity or uncertainty, and individuals look to others as a source of information to guide their decisions. Unlike normative social influence, which is driven by the desire for social approval and acceptance, ISI is driven by the desire to make correct choices or to understand the appropriate way to behave in a given context. As an example, in an emergency situation like a fire in a public building, individuals will often look to see how others are responding. If a majority of people start moving towards one exit, others are likely to follow, assuming these individuals know the best or safest way out, even though there are no clear signs indicating that this is true. This can actually lead to disasters with people being crushed in crowds. Or, in this video from Brazil, a group of CrossFit runners causes confusion, with some people assuming they're actually running away from danger. They start running in the same direction, causing a chain reaction. Everyone assumes the group has more information than they do, and they need to run too. Another good example is when starting a new job. There's likely a range of basic information you need to know, like where to hang your coat and how long to take for a break. You don't want to ask about every single piece of information, so new employees will observe and copy the behavior of more experienced staff. In the same way, when visiting a new culture, people will observe locals for cues on how to behave appropriately. If you travel to Japan, you might notice that people bow when greeting each other and begin to do the same. Before I move on, asking you to write about types of conformity or explanations of conformity sound like similar questions. And you've likely guessed that in the real exam, students often get confused and write about the wrong terminology. Keep this in mind during your revision. It's an easy mistake to make, and actually one of the reasons I added a key term checker to my app. Another shameless plug, but it is true. Now, we might need to evaluate what we've covered so far, but before doing that, I want to tell you about a classic study of conformity by Solomon Ash. That's because we need to know about this study anyway, and we can use the findings of the study to evaluate explanations of conformity. The Ash Experiment In Ash's classic study of conformity, he used groups of male students. But unknown to one real participant, all the other men around the table were actors, working on behalf of the experimenter. We'll call these people confederates. The real participant was told the task was about visual perception, and they had to simply identify the correct comparison line, the one that matched the standard line. You can see an example here, and you likely have no difficulty identifying B as the correct answer. In Ash's study, there are 18 cards like this, 18 trials. 
Each man around the table took it in turns to say their response, with the real participant being sat in the second to last place. And at first, each confederate gave the correct answer. In the final 12 critical trials, something strange happened. The confederates all gave the same incorrect answer. You might want to consider what you'd be feeling in this situation. You know for sure what the right answer is, but everyone else is disagreeing with you. Now at first, you might be able to disagree with the group, but as this goes on for round after round, you're going to feel more and more uncomfortable. You may even feel that to save yourself feeling embarrassed from having to disagree with this group again and again, it may just be easier to repeat the same wrong answer. In the study, while conforming on every single critical trial was rare, only 5% of participants never resisted once. The majority, 75% of participants, gave into group pressure and conformed at least once. If we look at all of the critical trials, we can see that there was a mean conformity rate of 32%. Ash's findings are a support of normative social influence. And if we're asked to write about NSI, we can use the study as an evaluation. The participants conformed for social approval on what was an obvious, so an unambiguous task. Variables affecting conformity as investigated by Ash. You can see here the main findings of Ash's original research. In the exam, you're more likely to have to write about the variations of Ash's experiment than the original experiment itself. But we'll want to compare the results of each variation to the original experiment to explain how the variation alters conformity. In Ash's group size variation, Ash exactly replicated the original setup, but with one, two, three, four, eight, and 16 confederates. This is the original table from Ash's paper. I've added the conformity rate and a graph of the results. You should be able to see an interesting pattern here with one or two confederates, the conformity rate is low. It seems to be easy to resist an individual or a couple. However, when there are three confederates, the conformity rate rises dramatically, but then levels off and seems to decrease a little at 16 confederates. So, if you're able to resist a small group, you're able to resist a large group. Don't feel you need to memorize all of these figures, but you should be able to outline the general pattern of results. In Ash's unanimity variation, he instructed one of the confederates answering before the participant to act as an ally. This dissenter gave the correct answer, providing social support for the true participant. This made it easier to resist the power of the group, so the conformity rate dropped to 5.5%. In the final task difficulty variation, Ash increased the difficulty of the task by making the comparison lines closer in length to the standard line. This increased the ambiguity of the task. And while Ash didn't report exact figures, he did say this significantly increased the rate of conformity. And we can suggest the reason for this increase is due to the addition of informational social influence. Participants being less sure of the correct answer, so looking to the group for guidance so they can be correct. Evaluating Ash's experiment. One of the positives of Ash's original study and variations is that as a lab study, it used standardized procedures that had a high level of control over variables. This control means each participant had the same experience. They all viewed the same lines and experienced the same level of normative social influence from the Confederates. Which means Ash's study has internal validity. Perrin and Spencer criticized the generalizability of Ash's work to modern society, suggesting it lacks temporal validity. And the study is over 70 years old. In their replication with a more modern British student sample, in 396 critical trials, there was only one example of conformity. They argued that the extreme conformity in Ash's work reflected the mindset of Cold War Americans, who were afraid of standing out from the crowd. The researchers argue that people are now more willing to resist normative social influence. Another generalizability issue for Ash is the all-American sample. This potential for cultural bias was investigated during a meta-analysis by Bond. 133 studies across 17 countries were included, finding general support for Ash's original findings, but significant differences between collectivist societies that value group harmony and individualistic societies who value personal freedom. Perhaps unsurprisingly, collectivist societies were more conformist. This suggests that normative social influence is not universal, were experienced differently depending on cultural background. 
you've likely never experienced a situation like Ash's conformity study. For this reason, we can say his task lacks mundane realism. People do conform in real life. However, it's usually around people they know personally and on work tasks or to their friends' opinions while socializing. We don't often find ourselves in a room full of strangers judging line lengths. So Ash's work may tell us little about real life conformity. Evaluating explanations for conformity. Now we're familiar with Ash's research, we can evaluate the explanations for conformity with Ash. So, the original study supports normative social influence. The task was obvious and unambiguous, which means the reason why the participants conformed was to avoid being socially rejected by the group. In another variation we didn't mention, participants could write down their responses in secret, eliminating the fear of rejection, which resulted in a significant reduction in conformity. The task difficulty variation of ASH can be used as supporting research for informational social influence. Increasing the difficulty of the task made it more ambiguous, leading to the participants questioning their judgment. This would explain why the conformity rates increased, with the participants relying more on the judgments of the confederates to make the correct decision. So far we've talked about situational factors that influence conformity, but there's good reason to believe that some people have a personality that makes them more or less likely to conform to others. These dispositional explanations include N affiliators, people who have a stronger than normal need to be liked by others, leading to increased conformity, whereas people with high confidence are less likely to conform, as well as people with what is known as an internal locus of control. We'll cover locus of control in the resistance video, but basically they're people who feel they are personally in control of and responsible for their actions. Our final evaluation is the fact it can be quite difficult to work out if conformity in participants is due to ISI or NSI. It may be that even the person conforming isn't fully aware of their motivations. This is even more true in real life examples of conformity. We often don't have a full understanding of a situation or issue, and we usually want social approval. So most cases of real world conformity are likely to be a combination of both explanations. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, and now I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. And a special thank you to Azzy Taylor for supporting at the developer level. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons, so if you do decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. These include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course including questions on the social influence unit. I hope this was helpful, and I will see you in the next Psych Boost video.